I would like to ask you to forgive me for two things. First, I'm an archaeologist. So I mean that I'm not a specialist in digital technology, neither an architect, neither a conservationist. And the second thing I want you to forgive me too is that I am French. <laughs> so I mean that my English is unfortunately not going to match the solemnity of the place and the quality of the audience. But if you forgive me, I can go on and talk to you talk a bit about Afghanistan. Cultural heritage management, 3D technology for Afghanistan past. I think it's something which should be very clear for you, since I would say we have this wonderful introduction made by Ben, and also this wonderful presentation about how the destruction of the Buddha of Bamiyan has been a key point in the development of the awareness of the fragility of human heritage, of cultural heritage in Afghanistan, but also in the world. I see the day Bamiyan Buddha were blasted, it was the day also where, when Afghan cultural heritage entered the global cultural heritage. So I would say one question everybody can ask himself is that, okay, Buddha Banyan has been destroyed 12 years ago. What's happening right now in Afghanistan? And I would say that the situation in Afghanistan is tragic. It's tragic because I would say what has been seen is the most visible thing, the destruction of the Buddha of Bamiyan. But still, you have a lot of destruction going on. Destruction, which are that's, uh, due to vandalism, looting, or deregulations. Let's start with the illegal excavation, with a few pictures, a few slides, which are going to give you also, I would say, a good illustration of what is happening in other countries, namely Iraq, namely Syria, where the phenomenon is developing to an incredible rate. That's a picture which had been taken in the 60s of an archaeological site whose name is Aichanum, a Greek city which was founded in the 4th century BC on the very bank of the Amudaria River, the Oxus of the old time, which had been, I would say, the easternmost Greek colony in the um, old world. That's a picture before, and that's a picture now. What you can see is that this site had been completely looted. All the black dots are illegal excavation, and virtually the site is destroyed. We say a place where it had been found, I would say the first remains of the Greek presence in this area, where it had been found also manuscript from Greek philosopher, is destroyed. Let's go on with another example. It's a picture I took uh, three weeks ago. It's the north of the oasis of Balkh, so it's the very north of uh, Afghanistan. And what you see is that, the, I would say, the result of the works of a looter, a very nice building from the 6th century BC, which is going to collapse because it had been mined, let us say, by looters. That's another example. Uh, related to a site I'm going to talk a bit more. It's a place called Mesainak, uh, which is 60 kilometers south of uh, Kabul. And this site was known first because it had been completely looted. Fortunately, not completely. And that's an example of what had been found during the lootings. The other problem Afghanistan is facing, but it's also a common problem for many countries, I would say, is development. Development in Afghanistan is thriving because there is a lot of money. So we have huge development in urbanism. Why? Because there is a lot of people coming back from exile. There is a huge development in mining activities, and I'm going to develop this uh, kind of subject. And there is also huge development in infrastructure. And even if we in Europe, in America, have been developing, I would say, rescue archaeology techniques, in a country like 
Afghanistan, where virtually there is no more archaeologists working, the situation is terrible. That's an illustration of how devastating can be urbanism when it's without any control. This is a huge Islamic site from the 10th century AD, whose name is Lashkari Bazar. Lashkari Bazar is close from a place whose name is Lashkarga, which is the main city of Helmand province. Helmand province is quite importantly well known in UK, because I would say there was a huge involvement of um, UK government in, uh, in Helmand. And this is a picture of the site which had been taken thanks to Google. I have also a picture, but this one is good. Uh, um, in 2004, in 2004, it was still possible to see the main remains, remains of this Islamic city, which had been partly excavated by Dafa, my institute in the, in the 50s. That's another picture which had been taken two years ago. And you see that there is no more of this uh, Islamic monument. They are completely invaded by modern construction. <laughs> the monuments were so well preserved that people had just to put doors, windows, a roof, and to settle there. But you can imagine the, the damages for the cultural heritage. That's an example I'm going to develop a bit further, which is how we say mining activity. Mining activity is probably the best way for Afghanistan to get, I would say, a clean income with going to give to this country the tools to be, a, I would say, a normal country. So there is a huge interest in it and a huge development in the evaluation of mining potential. And among the projects which had been selected, there is this project, 60 kilometer of south of Kabul, whose name is Mesainak. It means, I would say, the copper well, more or less. And it's, from an economical, economical point of view, it's a huge site and the second unexploited uh, copper uh, potential in the world. So you can imagine that the potential in terms of economy is going to be huge. The only problem is that on the top of the copper deposit, there is a huge archaeological site, four square kilometers. And a huge archaeological site, I, well, in itself it will be deserving, I would say, a complete speech, but I, I'm going to show you very quickly um, why this site is so rich and to give you some glimpse of uh, the richness of this site. We have wall paintings, incredible wall paintings, very close from those from Dunhuang. And, um, well, this is an example, this is an example of, I would say, square meter and square meter of wall paintings. We have <coughs> clay statue, good illustration has been given this morning, uh, again with Mogao. Uh, this is a picture of, I would say, standing uh, statue of clay. They are preserved up to, uh, let's just say, the waist. It's, um, they are, as they are now, they are two meter height, so we can reconstruct statue which were in between five, six, and seven meter height. That's one of my Afghan colleagues working on them. We have also incredible and I should add that we have been starting working on this site in April 2009. Now I think it's thousands of these clay statues we have been able to uncover. We have also stone statues. This is a very good example of one of these statues. We have, I would say, all, again, I would say hundreds of these statues which had been uncovered. And uh, for those who are specialists in uh, Buddhism, maybe there are some of them. This is a statue of Avalokiteshvara, which is a Bodhisattva. And you can see the quality of this uh, statue. But we have also wooden statue, and this uh, uh, wooden statue of Buddha is probably the oldest known wooden statue of Buddha in the Buddhist world. So it, you can imagine that it's something which is really incredible for us arch archaeologists to be able to uncover, but in terms of value in cultural heritage, it's also incredible. When we have also manuscript. This is an example of the kind where, oh, they are preserved. So it means that it's also a good illustration to show you that uh, excavating is one thing, but then after we had to care about what had been excavated. And there is huge work in terms of restoration to, um, to do on all these items. And there is a new factor which had 
I would say, been largely underestimated until now for Afghanistan, it's erosion. Erosion is, um, I would say, Afghanistan is a country where there is uh, very poor vegetation. When uh, now we say we have problem with the rains and with snow, so it means that the good part of the archaeological site of Afghanistan are in danger to be simply washed up due to the erosion. That's an example of a site whose name is Sharizoak. It's in Bamiyan Valley, so I would say it's 20 kilometers from the Buddha. And you can see distinctly that good part of the towers or of the walls had been completely already washed up. So there is a real concern also from this point of view. This is another example of a site which is endangered due to, I would say, natural condition, uh, mainly erosion, wind, uh, rain. It's uh, the mosque of Aji Piada. Uh, Aji Piada is a very interesting mosque because it's probably one of the oldest uh, mosques in the Islamic world, which is kept and as it is, I would say, and uh, which has still got its original decoration. So what can we do? And what we can do, I would say, I say it collectively, I would say even uh, I'm working a lot on this uh, subject, I think that when you are dealing with such a subject like Afghanistan cultural heritage, you have to think uh, globally and try to involve as much partner as we can. What can we do is first documenting, and I would say second is documenting, and third is documenting. But documenting with who and for who, and that's also a very important point, and I was very pleased to uh, notice that many people had been developing this, uh, this, uh, this issue. I would say that documenting, if there is nobody then after to work on the documentation, it's useless. And the first way to work on the documentation, the documentation is the people of the country. That's the only one who are in position to be able to, I would say, cope with the problem of conservation. Then I would say that it means involving people at a certain level of expertise, but also it can't work only, and I would say the illustration in Afghanistan is really very clear, if you are involving communities. Involving community, what does it mean? It means that when you are working on a mosque, like the one I show you a slide of, we need to have, I would say, discussion with the people who are, I would say, visiting this mosque. And this mosque, and even if it's a bit destroyed, I would, say, I would say, it's still a place where people, a place of worshipping, people, a, a place where people enjoy to go. So we have to discuss with these people to say, okay, what we are going to do because we need to be a leader at the moment. It's, it's something for you, so you should be aware that it's uh, something that you are going to use, and it's not something against you, it's not something alien, it's something which should belong to you. That's the same, um, I would say, um, preoccupation that we had for this site that I'm going to develop, Messinac, uh, this huge copper mine where we had to develop uh, a rescue excavation, and the idea was to involve as much people as we can on the excavation. So at, at right now, I'm going back to Kabul next, uh, well, next Thursday. Uh, right now, we have, I would say, 500 workers from 12 villages around the place of excavation who are involved in the excavation, and they are the first supporters of archaeology. We have also 60 archaeologists, I would say mostly coming from Afghanistan, who are getting trained and involved in this project. Documenting, it means that it's really the urge of the subject here. And it's, uh, it means, I would say, using every technology. So 3D scanning, of course, it's 3D scanning. We have been using it with, I would say, one of the machines I've seen here. Uh, we have been using it for this mosque of Achipiada. We are using it on this site of Messinac. But the problem we had on a site like Messinac is the size. When you have four square kilometers, you have to adapt yourself and to find, I would say, sustainable uh, from both technically, from economically, solutions. So the idea was to develop, um, I would say, a drone. Let's call it in a much, uh, much more civil way, uh, an exacopter. And with which uh, we are doing, I would say, the documentation of the site uh, during the excavation. That's an, a, a picture of my two friends, uh, Yves Bellman and Philippe Barthélemy, who are the one working on this thing. So with this machine, which are, 
have been used also in many places of Afghanistan who are trying to, to map, to record, and to monitor. To monitor, as example, the site of um, Shari Zohak, the one we have seen which is going to be washed up. And uh, with, I would say, very good results. So we are able to create 3D models. We did also 3D printing. And we tried to understand what's happening, in which way we can act on the erosion and try to, I would say, preserve this, uh, uh, this monument. This is another site, Shari Kholhola, in the valley of Bamiantu, where we are working. And that's the work we are doing, thanks to this, all this uh, uh, digital technology. That's a reconstruction, and I would say it's a very uh, tragic thing, that uh, the reconstruction of the evolution of the destruction of this site of Shari Zohak. And so in, in pale gray, you have, I would say, the reconstitution of what was there at the beginning, so it's the 13th century, uh, what was it recording at the beginning of 20th century, and what we are recording now. And what is very clear, and I would say that that's something, so I think that somebody already had been uh, talking about, I would say, how useful 3D technology can be to monitor the evolution of, um, of the monument, but this is a very good example. So the projection is in between 20 years, 30 years, the site is in danger to be completely washed up. That's, I would say, 3D technology to monitor the site. That's the point. The other point is, I would say, really to use 3D technology in order to, to document and also, in a way, to manage uh, the archaeological ex exhibition. I'm coming back to this example of Messinac. We are using uh, these drone images uh, with, I would say, satellite images because, well, it happens that Afghanistan is a country where a lot of people are taking Im satellite images, and this lot of people are kind enough to give them a part of them, so we can use that, that and we can them, use them with, I would say, in correlation with the picture we are taking ourselves. So this is the general view of this site of Messinac, which has been done by the drone, and it's a combination of different pictures, and um, which are giving us the possibilities to create, I would say, topographical models, uh, which could be very precise. We have up to 10 centimeters in between two of these lines. And uh, the possibility to recreate. And uh, I was uh, in such a hurry when I left Paris that I didn't have time to bring, I would say, the 3D printing of these right images. <coughs> But I would say 3D technology, as we have seen, can be used also in a much more detailed way. These are, I would say, detailed view of some of the area of uh, this archaeological site. Pictures. From pictures, we can have plants, like, again, this one. But also, we can use uh, this technology to document statues, like this one or even monuments like stupa, which are kind of small, um, let's say, ex voto. Archaeological application is that we can use this technology really to monitor the evolution of the archaeological sites. It's again, and it is example of Messinac, with a picture of the central area when we started the excavation. This is a picture taken last year, and uh, my guys are coming back uh, in within four days to make the completion of the work. Another area, which is all of these monuments are more or less Buddhist monastery. And another area with, again, I would say, monument. I don't want to be too long because I think that we are going to have very interesting speech after mine. And I want to finish. <coughs> It would have been, I would say, necessary to have hours to, to, to develop the subject. But I want to finish on a quotation which is very dear to me. It's a quotation of Paul Valéry, a French philosopher. He said, just after the First World War, nous autres civilisations, nous savons maintenant que nous sommes mortels. We, civilization, we are now fully aware that we are mortals. After the First World War, People realized that, I would say, they were, I would say, suiciding themselves. They were suiciding their civilization. But even at this time, I would say this quote is, was very positive because mortals, they've always, I would say, families. 
they have deaths. We, we are going to keep the memory of these people. And what you are witnessing right now is that memory itself is going to be killed. And I want to finish with, uh, we say, another view of this site to show you, I would say, um, how useful can be the 3D technology in, uh, in order to understand the site, in order to document it, and in order also to present it again, I would say, to those who are the first interested in this preservation, I mean, cell, local population, Afghan, but also we, the global population, who are who is witnessing, I would say, the destruction of our memory. Thank you very much for your attention.